this is actually a, a very special time, I know, for all of us, and, and certainly for me. But, so let me start before I start babbling. Um, in 2002, I actually wrote a, a tribute to Serge Muscovici. It was called The Art of Mentoring. It's personal. Little did I think that a dozen years later, we would be mourning his passing and I would be delivering another tribute. This is a special time for me to pay tribute who was my most important mentor for over 40 years. The timing is prescient, prescient because I've just finished my first book for a, a non-academic, a wide audience. In fact, I was gonna show, show you the title because it shows a fish going in one direction and a little red one going in the other direction, okay? And essentially, um, Writing this book probably brought home just how much influence Serge had on the way I think, as well as on the specific studies that I was citing in the book. There's a reason why I dedicated it to him, along with Henri Tajfel and Leonard Berkowitz. Serge would like the title, it's called In Defense of Troublemakers, The Power of Dissent in Life and Business. And even that title owes a debt to Serge. The the importance of applicability to life and business being one aspect, okay. And in writing this book, I came to appreciate even more his impact on the field and on me personally. I'll confine my comments to the specific area of minority influence. And in fact, I found very interesting and could and will add to some of the general points made by Juan Perez and his collaborators in this recent very touching tribute uh, to Serge. They captured the elements, I think, of the way he thought. And those insights match my experience on his contributions to minority influence. They also illustrate his contributions beyond specific writings. The first is the importance of common sense, something we know that is not so common. Serge was skeptical of experiments as a, a method of verification, and he disliked studies that added one more variable, which is that we know is the easy way to publish. You know, you have a regular paradigm everybody's familiar with and you add something and so it's familiar and it, you get past the, the gates where if you try to do something quite novel, you get asked a lot of questions. Okay. He often said to me though, in terms of applicability and common sense, is that we should be speaking to sociologists, anthropologists, political scientists, teachers, lawyers, businessmen, healthcare workers, and instead we were only talking to each other. A second of the contributions that I'm playing off of Juan's uh, uh, and his collaborators' uh, article is that he was keenly aware of the fact that individuals are embedded in relationships and social groups. We're not solitary. Communication is not just a set of words. Opinion change is not just in the head of an individual as a recipient of persuasive attempts. Influence is part of a relationship, one that is shaped by the sender and the receiver. Serge was able to see that persuasion flows not just from those high on the totem pole in terms of power or numbers. This is what most of us were taught in that era. But from those low on those dimensions. In, in minorities can influence majorities as well as vice versa. And it's the combination of this insight and Serge's focus on real world applicability that gave us this new field of minority influence. It changed the way we thought about influence. Serge's approach, I think, was partly informed by his own real world experience. Growing up during World War II, he saw domination and submission. He also saw, though, protest and courage. He saw the prices paid for speaking to power. These issues came home in the here and now of the late 1960s. 1968 was a particularly important year he was deeply affected by the May 1968 uprising in Paris, as was I in Chicago in the fall of that year, which was my first job was at the University of Chicago. It was a time of, there of protest, and one remembers the Democratic National Convention, which was essentially a bloodbath in the streets. I remember because we talked often about this when I was a visiting professor in Serge's Equipe two years later. That Equipe included very many special people, among them, Willem Dwaz and the two individuals who joined Serge in that first experimental study on minority influence, namely Elizabeth Lage and Patricia Neuve. That study documented the phenomenon of minority influence 
but it also showed the important mechanisms that have stood the test of time. I always find it interesting that the first studies and also the, the, the first ooh, representation of ideas often carry with it far more than what people remember, and they really set the tone. They understood the complexity of the phenomenon, so it's much more than a demonstration. It did even more than that because it forced us to re-examine long-held biases in social psychology. Liking and influence do not necessarily go hand in hand. Opinion change can be hidden. It may, may not be publicly displayed. Conflict of ideas is at the core of social change. So one of the concepts, of course, that he clearly brought, which was kind of unheard of at the time, was that minorities can win. And it didn't require credibility or power or numbers, something that was in all the textbooks. I mean, when I studied, that's, that was the definition of influence. It went from the strong to the weak. But now, with his work, we can no longer believe that an individual or a minority of individuals had only two choices, which is what, the way the studies were set up. You could either agree, conform, or you could be silent. So the notion that they could stand up, speak, and have influence was not there in the textbooks, but it was there in the streets. Serge didn't hide in a laboratory diligently adding to a list of variables that made statistically significant differences. He didn't try to clean up research literatures that were incomplete or in conflict. His was a style that explored. And in fact, I was reminded of um, someone who, a, a powerful interview of Charlie Towns, who won the Nobel Prize and is known for the Maser and Laser. I was privileged to spend 10 hours interviewing him. And he had, that, he had something about him that I think Serge had as well, and he was an explorer. We thought of explore in the sense that when he comes up with an idea, he doesn't stay around to try to clean it up and profit from it, you know, like many of the uh, uh, individuals do who say explore a new world, is that he kept exploring some other new vista. And Towns showed that, and I think Serge did as well. Serge translated those insights from into real life, into theory and experimental research, but you have to remember that in the late 1960s, the premise of social psychology was that influence flowed from the strong to the weak. It was the many and not the few who persuaded. Even when the many were wrong, and even when they argued a position that the individual, if alone, knew to be untrue. Those who did not have this power were seen as the recipients of influence. The holder of the minority opinion was the target of communication, which was aimed at changing his mind, and if he did not change, he was rejected and ridiculed. Going along clearly had benefits, even when it meant error. It is interesting that in 1951, Schachter, whose study you probably well know, because it had to do really with the reaction to a minority voice. I think it's interesting that Schachter never asked whether or not that dissenter had an impact on the majority. And I think it's because he never, it never crossed his mind, because that's not how influence worked. And in fact, the whole study was designed and illustrated what it was like to be in a minority because you got most of the communication directed at you to change your mind, and if you didn't, you were ridiculed and rejected. And I always just find it interesting that they could have just asked whether or not there was a reciprocal influence, but it never crossed anyone's mind because we, too, are kind of blinded by our own uh, kind of set of premises. The first experimental study that Serge did with uh, Patricia and, and Elizabeth it was more than a demonstration because it guided generations of research. And I think there were at least three contributions. I mean, there's many more, but I think three things stand out from that very first study. The first is the demonstration that minority views can persuade and that this can be studied experimentally. I think that was important. The minority can even get a majority to say blue is green, if you remember in that first study. The second contribution is that their ability to persuade comes from a con conviction rather than liking. At a time when everybody was advised to please or to compromise or to agree, essentially to avoid dislike, the premise was you can't have influence if you're not liked. Serge, however, saw that what was important was consistency and conviction rather than liking. The results show that compromise lessened dislike, namely if they, well, I'll, I'll go back to that, but it rendered the minority ineffective. A minority who continuously disagreed with the majority, but also was consistently wrong. So they kept saying, you know, the blue slides were green. They were consistently wrong, but they were at least consistent. 
It was more persuasive than one who occasionally agreed with the majority and thus was occasionally correct. Calling blue slides green on every slide was more persuasive than calling them green two-thirds of the time and blue one-third of the time. The consistent minority persuaded at least 9% of the time, if you remember in that original study. The compromise dissenter did not persuade. Cons namely, the bottom line is consistent error was more persuasive than inconsistent truth. Consistency was far more important than liking. The third contribution was that minority influence could, was by and large hidden. And we had always only studied influence in terms of overt agreement or at least movement on a Likert scale where I was here and now I'm here. Okay. In that first study, if you remember, after the public judgments were made, the participants sorted blue-green stimuli into two piles, blue or green. And essentially what they found is there was more influence than was clear even in their willingness to say publicly that the slides were green. Those exposed to the minority who consistently called those slides green placed more blue-green stimuli into the green category. Namely, they shifted the point where blue-green became categorized as green. So the impact was far greater than that 9% you saw at the public level. These insights, I think, prove more than just facts. They changed the nature of discourse about influence. Consistency and conviction were necessary for the minority's ability to persuade. Compromise, in fact, had a downside. Minority influence was, was greater than what was apparent at the public or direct level. Influence could be hidden. These were insights that kept many of us busy for, for a number of years while we explored those insights. But we clarified, we had there was some subtlety, we clarified the meaning of consistency, and we studied the trade-offs of compromise. So it developed, but the original impetus for that was done even, I think, in that very first study. I myself did a study on the trade-offs of compromise where we found, for example, that compromise is effective at the public level. You can make a deal. I hate to use and use that word these days given our recent election, but, uh, you know. Um, but it, compromise is effective in negotiation, but not for private change. Where consistency sometimes doesn't get people to move to you publicly, but in fact, the studies show that it has impact at a private level. And we had even looked at a, a sweet spot, if you will, is that if, you're, if you compromise at the last minute, you get it both ways. And it's because it's not seen as a lack of conviction. It's seen as only an attempt to make a deal, if you will. And so you can get private as well as public change. Serge's insights provided the fuel for generations of researchers who studied the hidden aspect of minority influence. And this is especially evident, I think, in the work of Gabriel Muni and his talented group of students, such as Juan Perez. Fabrizio Batera, Paolo Legrenzi, and Stamos Papastamu on the latent and indirect forms of influence by minority opinion. Our conception of influence became richer. Such studies were not just an extension of, of Serge's original study and ideas. They were not linear developments. They arose because he had convinced us that consistency and conviction were necessary, even if not sufficient, for minorities to persuade, and that influence was likely to be hidden. He taught us that conflict was essential for attitude change and for energizing thought. Serge was psychoanalytic at heart. He recognized the importance of meeting the resistances and the centrality of conflict for influence. Willem Dwaz, Gabriel Muni, and Juan Perez in particular extended this power of conflict to the understanding of cognitive development. My own work took a different tack, but it also owes a debt to that insight about the value of conflict. As an American trained in the US, except for a formative year with Omri Tajfel in Oxford, is that I had to actually move away from that training and take seriously Serge's image of American social psychology, as difficult as that was to take sometimes. His mimicry of that included a portrayal of idealism and naivete. You like a, he used to say to me, you like a me, I like a you, we will all get along, we can all resolve conflict. So we even had a journal of conflict resolution as though all conflicts could be resolved. But instead, Serge's life had shown him conflicts that could not be resolved, wars that continued, and ruthless dictators that were appeased. He taught me that conflict had an up upside. It could change attitudes, and it could lead to social change. My own interests move away from persuasion, namely from winning, from changing attitudes to a focus on the quality of thought and decisions. However, retain the lesson about the importance of conflict of ideas. With a long-standing interest in jury decision-making, it soon became clear to me 
that I cared less about who won than whether or not the jury made the right decision. More accurately, I cared about whether the jury engaged in good decision-making processes. I came to appreciate the importance of conflict of ideas for that good decision-making. In one of our very early studies, um, I watched dozens of long del deliberations over and over again and essentially saw that when a minority voice was present, those groups considered more evidence, more ways of viewing the evidence, and exhibited good decision-making. That insight essentially uh, came from what Serge and I, really, that Serge had planted about the importance of, uh, of conflict. And in fact, in our work, it showed that it causes people to are stimulated to think in different ways. When it's a majority, they think in narrow ways from the majority perspective. And when it's a dissenter, they think in broad ways, the kind of ways you wish you could train people to do. And repeatedly, we find the decision making is better. I'm going to kind of rush so that I can get through to kind of, I think, the more personal kind of part. I would be remiss if I didn't indicate Serge's influence, at least on me personally, and I know on the rest of you. Many of you in the audience have similar stories, I know. I saw seeds of Serge's in ideas on first meeting him at Royaumont. I actually go back that far. It was the beginning of the European Association. The participants were the chairs of Europe, except for me and Nick Johnson. Henri Tajfel had brought us. We didn't know we weren't supposed to be there. But Henri kind of showed that he could have enough power to be different, and so we brought us along. For me, it was life changing uh, because they were discussing this new organization and had dreams of effectively dealing with culture and the applicability of power and protest. Culture was real, so was the conflict of ideas. Everyone was heady about the prospect for an organization that would deal with these issues, and it was so inspiring that it actually caused me to continue toward my PhD at Cornell. Before that year, I had actually decided to quit. I was a math undergraduate major, and I just didn't feel we were studying important issues, and that meeting really changed my life. Uh, I'm going to kind of try to move a little bit, um, because I think that it would be easy to attribute Sergius' influence to his written or even verbal um, contributions and collaborations. I think it's, in, in my case, you know, we never collaborated on a study. Over 40 years, I spent most sabbaticals and many two to three month director day twos here in Paris. We would talk for hours, sometimes starting at 10 in the morning and continuing through meals, sometimes usually four hours in a cafe. Yet we never designed a study. We never worked on a task, we just talked. We might be observing others, might be discussing history or arguing over politics or his telling me what was wrong and right with America. He, that was a topic he enjoyed. <laughs> okay. There was also always an underpinning issue of influence, but it never took the form of a research design. What he conveyed and how he lived reflected his beliefs and his theories. As such, his impact was personal. I know how personal it was with many of the people here, Denise, Bernard, Marie, Elizabeth, Willem, Juan, Anna Maria. He translated, it translated beyond the issues that we studied. One, for example, was this importance of conviction. I can remember that at a time when I was writing something that was putting in question a whole field of negotiation, and I thought I'd have a very quick career since I was unknown and a fairly recent PhD. And Serge's comment was, as usual, was concise. What do you believe? And when I told him, he said, you must write that. Ever since then, whenever I think of parsing my words or appeasing or trying to you know, be nice <laughs> or whatever, I often see him as a little homunculus on my shoulder that if I don't tell the truth as I see it, he would not approve, okay? That lesson in conviction was more than personal. It permeated my research. And I think it was the background that caused me to question the value of techniques like devil's advocate, which we did, finding that it really doesn't work like authentic dissent. It's pretend dissent. It affected the work we did on brainstorming that I did with Marie and Bernard here, both in Paris and in the United States where we took on that long-standing notion you shouldn't criticize the ideas of others, one of the cardinal rules of brainstorming. And in both cultures, people thought it was nuts to try to do something in two cultures and expect the same finding, and yet we did. And that essentially, um, the conflict not only didn't lessen the, the um, amount of ideas, is it actually improved, improved it. So, so much for the unexamined premises of social psychology. Perhaps the most important lessons came from who Serge was, not just what he said. He was a man who knew his own mind. He never did anything he didn't want to do, which all of you know. Okay? He could be maddening, but he was authentic. He lived his life as he wished, as he believed, as he taught and wrote. 
Serge gave us back idealism about intellectual pursuits and research. He put the social back into social psychology. He convinced us that we could study things that mattered. We could use research by further understanding to fight wrongs, to make the world a little better. That is a powerful gift, one that has benefited the field, but one that has also enriched us personally as students, as colleagues, and friends. I hope these tributes make him smile. The field and we are part of his legacy, and the best we can do is carry on the insights and lessons that he provided us. I'm going to cry. <laughs> uh, I promised I wouldn't do this, but I found that at the end, and I was reading this last night and it really affected me, is a rest in peace, Serge, you sorely missed.